Okay, wonderful. So Piotr is gone for a moment, but he's going to be back after the presentation. If you still have any questions, uh, and I would like to remind you, there's going to be a networking virtual beer session at the end. So if any questions pop up, we're going to answer a, a, them at the end of the presentation or during the networking event. And now to Ethereum data structures and algorithms. So we're going to start with Merkel Patricia tree. Make Merkel Patricia tree is a uh, uh, fairly complex, uh, somewhat complex uh, data structure that is used everywhere in Ethereum. Well, how does it work? First, let's explain how the Patricia trees, or you might know already this data structure with, uh, with a little bit different name called Radix tree. So the Radix tree is a, is a tree in memory. Uh, the tree uh, has, uh, there is a root, there are children. It's, it, there is, it's not necessarily a binary tree. It could be, uh, could be very different kind of key, uh, trees. Uh, but the core idea is that we traverse from root all the way down to the leaf and every uh, node in the tree has a value and each path from root to to the leaf represents a value that is an aggregate of values in the different in the different nodes so usually radix trees are constructed on some kind of alphabet could be like just normal alphabet so if i traver traverse from the top uh, from the root T R I E, then we say, well, the uh, value at the leaf on the left side represents the value three, and we could traverse all the different paths to get all the different values like tree, tran, uh, toe, and token. So a pretty straightforward concept. A lot of you might have heard about it before, although it's not that popular data structure, so many of you might have not heard about it yet. Now we're gonna move to another data structure that is also a tree, but completely different tree. It's called Merkle tree. A Merkle tree is a tree of hashes. So again, it's not necessarily a binary tree. It could be very, it could be very different forms of trees, but as every tree, we have a root, we have children, uh, nodes, and we can traverse from the root to the leaf or other way around. So this way, it's more interesting to traverse other way around. So let's start traversing from the leaf. We have uh, in the leaf, we have a value. So let's make it tree again. And um, we also, the tree, the, the value uh, in the leaf is also hashed. So we store the hash of the tree. Uh, and, then, and then as we traverse again from the leaf to the root, we hash the value uh, of, uh, we hash the hash of previous child, right? So we have the value from the from, from our children. And in case we are a node that have multiple children, then we concatenate the values from those mm -hmm. nodes and, and that produce the new value. So except for the leaves, the values in the nodes are not really readable, just just hashes that don't really mean a lot uh, at the first sight. And um, yeah, so that's basically how it works. Here is an example. We put the same tree, but this time we put hashes as hexadecimal values. And as you will see in a moment, Ethereum loves hexadecimal values. So this tree has a very interesting property. If you change anything, I will go back a little bit. If you change anything in any, uh, in any leaf, that will change the value of in all the nodes uh, as you traverse them from the leaf to the root. So that obviously implies that if you change any value in the in any leaf, that will change the value in the root. Uh, so if we transform the tree a little bit and make it a little bit more orthogonal, uh, you can you can you can look at this uh, at this at this particular picture and imagine what the Merkle proof is. A Merkle proof is a proof that a certain value belongs to a certain tree. So we can imagine a huge tree uh, of billions or trillions or even many more values. And uh, it's a Merkle tree that we construct, but we don't need to have access to the whole tree to prove that a certain value belongs to the, the tree. So in this particular, in this particular particle case, imagine there is a tree, there is a hash value over here, 
uh, in the root that is known to us. And there is a value in the leaf, let's call it tree for now. And I can prove that the tree belongs to the root just by providing siblings, siblings. So looking at this picture, if I would like to prove that tree belongs to the root, I would need to provide this value, this value, and this value. I think you see my cursor, so you should be able to see what I'm talking about. So just by providing those three values, I can calculate this hash, this hash, and this hash, and calculate the root hash based on it. So we can create a method that could be in Solidity, any other language really as well. Uh, let's call it verify proofs, uh, verify proof. It has three arguments. It has a root that is well known to us. It has a leaf that we want to verify it belongs to the root. And we have uh, just an array of bytes. Um, OK, that sounds like a weird data structure. Why would I care? Well, I give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, and I think you might have heard of it, uh, I think it was uh, last fall, um, Uniswap made an airdrop. And the idea was that anyone who ever used Uniswap at least once would get some tokens, not some Uniswap tokens, and it get especially very important event because actually the tokens that would give away, even for those users who are very basic and uh, who, who like literally use Uniswap just once, it was way over $1,000. I think it was $1,400 or something like that. So significant amount of money. Now, a lot of many millions of people have used, uh, well, many millions of addresses has used uh, uh, Uniswap, I believe, or or a similar, uh, or quite a, a big amount. So if I would like to make an airdrop and make an ERC-20 token like Piot described just on the previous presentation, and I would like to send any everyone a transaction that would be huge amount of money that goes into those transactions. And that would include addresses that maybe are not even active anymore and like don't even care. Uh, so what Uniswap did is they build a Merkle tree. So they make a long list of all the addresses that they interacted with Uniswap at any point of time. And they build a very simple smart contract. And I have some pieces of that smart contract over here. And you can see that it has just two, it's a Merkle distributor. Uh, and, and basically, it has just two variables, just two member uh, variables here. Uh, it has a Merkle tree root. Uh, it also has a token, but well, in this case, it's um, just uni Uniswap token, so it doesn't matter that much. But they have a Merkle tree, uh, Merkle root, and they have just a, a clever mapping that basically is a bitmap that stores information if someone claimed uh, their tokens. So they construct the Merkle, Mer Merkle uh, distributor. It's pretty trivial, just setting the values. And here is a magical claim function. All you have to do is provide an index, which is a calculated value that doesn't really matter. It's just a trick to save a little bit of computational power. Uh, you provide the address of the account, so the account that interacted and want to benefit from uh and want to benefit from uh airdrop and uh the amount of money they believe uh, was um attributed to this account by uniswap and there is just an array of uh hashes that is a market proof and first thing we do is we check if the account uh, if the account already claimed the value if no if it did, then obviously we revert. Uh, but if we don't, we basically verify the marker, marker proof. And if it's fine, then we're gonna transfer the money, uh, transfer the money to the account. And that's pretty much it. There is also a setter that makes make sure you cannot that just checks that okay, this address already have uh, claimed their uh, money. And, and that's pretty much it. We have a verification. Verification basically calculates the hash from account and amount and verify them, uh, that across Merkle proof across all the data hashes. So as, as you see this, what might seem as exotic data structure is actually being used in blockchain space, but that's just the beginning. So now we spoke about two kinds of trees, right? We spoke about Radix tree the one that you can traverse to get a value. 
and a Merkle tree, the, the one that uh, basically store hashes. So now let's try to connect them together and see what happens. We can create Merkel Patricia tree. Let's make it simple for now. Let's make it a set. So Merkel Patricia tree in Ethereum uh, space has um, is indexed by uh, fixed uh, sized bytes uh, values. Let's say a machine world uh, words. So uh, and we to make it easy to to write, we just display that as hexadecimal values. So in this case, we have a Merkle Patricia tree that we can traverse from the root to the bottom. And uh, each node uh, is a one nimble, and one nimble is a value from zero to, uh, well, zero, one, two, three, four, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, there is also a D, which is value, which we ain't gonna use for now. And when we traverse the tree, we can, uh, we can collect those numbers and every leaf represents a certain uh, certain um, machine word center, uh, cer certain fixed byte length value that we represent at hexadecimal. So that's a set, but let's make it better. Let's make it a dictionary. Let's make it a map. Let's make it something that has key value. Uh, let's make it a key value store. So in this case, as we traverse from the top to the bottom, we collect the key and the key points out to a specific value in the uh, in the leaf, in the uh, uh, when we it, the value at the bottom of the tree, and um, it's also important that at each each node is hashed. So if we change if we change one if we change one value in uh, in the leaf, we're gonna need to change values uh, all the way up to the to the root, including the root itself. So, uh, Merkle Patricia tree, and if you look at the tree, if you look at the tree and imagine there is a um, set of values, then the values are probably, the set of values is probably much smaller than the space of possible values. So let's say it's a 64 bit um, byte strings. So like, let's say eight bytes that we use to index, that would be two to power of 64 possible values that would be more than any memory on any computer can store. So on any reasonable computer can store. So um, uh, therefore uh, it would mean there is a lot of nodes that basically have just one child. Like there, it would be not very dense tree. So what Ethereum does, it does, it creates kind of a compression. So we have different node types. You have a, node type that basically represents a branch. So there is more than one value. It has more than one value. Uh, it has more than one child, one value, but more than one child. We have an extension that has just a one value, but also it might represent multiple levels. And we have a leaf that represents a uh, well node at the end of the, at the bottom of the tree. Are you ready? Boom, here is an example. <laughs> so, if you look, look, look at the right top corners, we are, uh, in this example, we basically have a, a map or a dictionary, a key value store that we index with three bytes keys. So six nimbles, six hexadecimal chars, and each has a value that is, well, in this case, let's say integer uh, that represents the uh, account balance. And if we look at the top of the tree, we have a root extension node. Well, root root means just a root node, and extension node is a kind of node that goes through the multiple multiple nimbles, right? So we have A7. And if you look at the node at the top, there is just one node, and it represents A7 prefix. And if you see at the values at the right top corner, you see that every single value in that particular instance of key value store starts with A7. But then if you look at the first pos third position, you see that there are differences in different, uh, uh, for, for different va key value pairs. So there is one, seven, F, and seven. And therefore, as a child of, root extent of the extension node, we have a branch node that will lead into three different directions. So if we decide to go for one, you see there is only one key that has, that 
uh, starts with A71. So we end up with the leaf node that represent the rest of the path. One, three, five, five, one, three, five, five. And similarly, it goes for F. If we go for A7F, you see that there is only one value. So there is a leaf node that represents 9765, 9765. So as you traverse from the root to the leaf, you collect those different nimbles. You can build keys that stores the values. And the last two, uh, last most complicated path goes for extension node, 8787. Seven again, you can see there are two options now. So, but both options are going in, uh, are following with the same nimbles, D3, 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 D3. And then there is a branch node again on position five because there is a difference uh, on position five. There is three and nine that are represented respectively by those. Uh, uh, no, this is not what I wanted to do. That are uh, represented by those leaf nodes over here. Every leaf, leaf node has a value as expected. Whew. I hope you understand it. If you don't, let me know. We will we will discuss it some more uh, at the end. So this is Merkle Patricia tree, a very clever tree that has um, that we can easily uh, that we can store key values. Uh, key are any bytes, strings, but it needs to be a fixed size. So a certain size for a particular Merkle Patricia tree. And now let's talk about uh, storing history. So imagine you have, so th this is something that, call, that is called version data structure. So imagine you have a tree and you would like to add uh, a new item to the tree. The problem with, uh, if you add a new item to the tree, you're going to modify the tree and you're forever you're gonna forget about how the tree should be represented. How is, uh, what was the old version of the tree? What was the, the old set that was represented? Wouldn't it be great to build a, such a data structure that you can have every single, every single version of data available for you to traverse in, uh, to, the, to the past or to the future? So you can do that with, uh, with uh, versioned trees. And uh, in particular, you can do it with Merkle Patricia tree. So imagine you have this token. Instead of connecting them to this node uh, uh, or, or this node and trying to modify the tree, we can build completely new path that, is represent, uh, that represents the path from the, uh, well, from the, uh, from the, leaf to the root or other way around. And, but that's going to create only, only that many nodes as high as the tree is, right? So if the, if, if the tree have three levels, that's only going to create three nodes. But what happens is we create a new root. So now we have a one data structure that is a list of roots and every root represents a different tree, but the tree trees are interconnected and we can do it and we can do it quite a lot. So we can create all, all the versions. Every time we insert or delete an element, we can just create a new path. So th this is pretty efficient uh, in terms of uh, memory, because if you would like to do it, let's say, on arrays, uh, then you would need to create a new array every single time you want to store a new version. So why, why, why are we talking about all those complex data structures? Well, it turns out that Ethereum stores pretty much everything in Merkle Patricia tree. There is a state tree that stores all the information about all the variables and all the different, in all the different smart contracts. There's a transaction tree that stores all the information about transactions. And there is a receipt tree that stores all the information about all the executions of every single transaction. So I hope you're ready. Boom. <laughs> And here goes the next one. It might seem a little bit complex. When we finish with that slide, I think it's going to be pretty straightforward. And you're going to understand the, how the whole blockchain, how the whole Ethereum blockchain is structured. So at the top, we have two blocks. So every, every, time, every time a uh, new block is mined, a new block header is created. A new block header has an information about hash of the previous block. So in blockchain space, you can think about hash as a pointer. Pointer. So if you have a hash to a certain block or you have a hash to a certain um, transaction, that's basically a pointer that allows you to look into Merkle Patricia tree and get this transaction. 
So we have a block number n, and we have a following block number n plus one. Uh, n plus one points with his hash to previous block number one, number n. And we're going to look at some of those fields. We're going to look at the timestamp. So timestamp is basically a timestamp that a uh, miner is giving to a block at the time of mining. There are some rules about timestamp. You cannot do a random time timestamp. The timestamp cannot be older than uh, like 15 minutes from previous block and you know this kind of stuff. It cannot be before the last block and so on. That just to make sure that uh, miners don't do too much of time manipulation. Although there is a little bit of space for time manipulation. Obviously, there is uncle hash which is an ankle blocks, which we're going to talk about what are the ankle blocks we're going to talk about in the future. But, you know, <coughs> the Bitcoin uh, has the notion of parent block or previous block. Uh, in um, Ethereum, we also have a notion of ankle block. We have beneficiary. Also, a different name for this field is Coinbase. So it's a, uh, uh, which might resemble something in your mind, different than uh, than the field, uh, uh, also related to blockchain cryptocurrencies. So beneficiary or Coinbase is address of, of the miner who going to benefit from mining the transaction. Uh, there are a couple of other things worth mentioning. Difficulty is a difficulty of that block. So, you know, at any point of time, there is a global competition among uh, miners, Ethereum miners, and that same goes for Bitcoin and many other blockchains. Who gonna be the one, the next one to win? Uh, win the competition is gonna get rewarded and be the creator for the next block. So difficulty is just a number of zeros in in, in the hash that needs to be calculated, uh, and basically miners just calculating the hashes with a different with a different uh, nouns. And when they do have enough zeros in front of uh, that. Uh, corresponds to the difficulty, they are considered to be the winners for that particular um, for that particular block. We ain't gonna talk about consensus algorithms. What happens if there is a uh, if there is a tie, and so on and so forth? We uh, there is much more that can be said about it, but not yet. So there is a black number gas limit for the whole block gas used by all the transactions in this block, uh, and uh, and a bunch of other things. Uh, but I want to uh, get your attention to show you the last row of fields. There is a state route, transaction route, and receipt route, which are all routes of the different um, Merkel Patricia trees that uh, that store state of the whole blockchain, uh, list of all the transaction, and list of all the uh, receipt. And you know you can think about those as a small database or key value store once more. Good. So um, uh, yeah. So let's talk about state root. State root is the root uh, is the information about the state of the uh, stores the root for the Merkle tree that represents the whole state of Ethereum. So that includes all the addresses. So the state root is indexed by address on Ethereum, hexadecimal, the kind of that many of you might be very familiar with by now. And um, what is the value? What is the value in the tree? Well, the value of the tree are four different values. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a aggregate of four values. So there is a balance, a second one, that basically says how much money is on the account. So that's pretty straightforward. Everybody can relate to that one. Uh, there is a nouns that is uh, basically a number of transactions that were issued. There were issued from this that were mined on this particular account so far. That only uh, uh, that only is important information if the account is normal wallet. If it's not a smart contract. If it is a smart contract, the nouns is not very important. But what becomes important is code hash and stage uh, and storage root. Well, the code hash is simply a hash of uh, uh, of the smart contract of the bytecode of the smart contract that was deployed. Now, the code hash is a hash, and a hash on blockchain, as we know, is basically a pointer because there is yet another uh, yet another uh, Merkle Patricia tree that stores all the code. Uh, all the different bytecodes, which means that every single bytecode is the duplicated. And if I deploy two smart contracts, 
or I deploy one and someone else deploys the other and they have the same bytecode, it is only stored once. And here we have a storage root. A storage root is a, uh, is a root of a Merkle tree again. And uh, it's a tree that stores all the information, all the variables that are used by the smart contracts that are um, carried across the transactions that are not just temporary variables. And what you can see is those weird lines pointing from one, fr from state tree of one, of one uh, block to a straight tree of the second one, which is exactly we, the reason for that is what I was explaining just a moment ago, which is the Merkle Patricia tree are versioned, which means we can fairly easy traverse in the past and get the value of any specific field or any specific uh, balance or really anything that is in the state, we can easily query blockchain node uh, to get the value. So I hope that's a little bit more uh, understandable now. Mm. Now we're going to talk about the, what are the implications for Ethereum nodes. So there was a there was an event, I think it was maybe two or three years ago, when someone said it, the Ethereum node is growing really fast and it already takes one terabyte of data. And you know, like Ethereum is really poor in terms of scalability. And that was a little bit of misinformation because it was true that if you want to store the whole history, if you want to have a full node that stores all the history of Ethereum, it takes one terabyte. But if you think about it, uh, it but, but then if you want to st store only the latest state, it might be a little bit different now, but I think at the time it was maybe 200 gigabytes to store uh, the full state of Ethereum as it is today. And it was at the day, I think it might be more like 300, 400 today. Uh, but, you know, it was much. For, so, so to start a whole history, it was only five times more. It was not like thousands of times more as one would expect if you make a copy of everything, uh, or everything as many times as many blocks there are. And there are mi millions of blocks already being uh, that was mined on Ethereum. So that would be quite a lot. So actually, that was a demonstration on how efficient, uh, how efficiently data is stored on Ethereum. Uh, but that also uh, made people aware that you can run very different types of full nodes. So what is a full node? A full node is a kind of node that uh, downloaded the whole history of Ethereum and verify every single transaction to make sure there is no single block that represents uh like a malicious transaction like a fake transaction like a double spade link like i spend the money that i don't have or i spend the money i have twice uh and and with ethereum you can do it in many ways very efficiently so you can for example um, download the, the first block and the second block and the third block and keep verifying that and i think at this time point of time it already takes a couple of weeks to actually forward verify uh, like download the whole history and forward verify it and um, but then you have very secure node because you traverse the whole history and you know that you know not a single transaction is a fake transaction. But you can also because it takes a couple of weeks, you can start with downloading the current state and verify it backwards. So initially, when the when the node starts, it's not yet fully verified, but it's able to operate. And only after a week two or three, when the whole history is downloaded, but now in the reverse order you can see uh, the full the node is fully verified and you know that uh, and you know that uh, there are no transactions that break the rules but here is the thing you don't really need to do that you don't really need to do that you don't really need to have fully verified node with all the history uh, to be uh, to, to feel very safe all you need is a prune node so if we go a little bit back to uh, to the previous slide you can see that you only need to download uh, hashes of the. Uh, you only need to download headers of the blocks to see that there is a uh, to have all the information, right? So you have all the transactions. You can verify with Merkle truths if they are there, and there is a difficulty, and there is a and there is a hash, and uh, of the block, and there is a, a hash that was developed by miner that was mined by miner that proved how difficult it was how many 
how many computational power was required. So if someone want, would like to just rewrite, just rewrite the block headers, not the state of the blockchain, but just the, uh, just the malicious history of block headers, he would need to have a computational power bigger than the accumulated power of, of computations that was done throughout the history of the whole blockchain, Ethereum blockchain. So that's very highly unlikely. So you don't really need a full node uh, to, to feel very secure. You, you, it's enough to use a prune node. And you can even, you, you can even just have like a very, very limited view on the blockchain. You don't even need to have like to store the current state. You only need to the current, uh, like download all the headers and then verify the Merkle proof, proofs against state that is provided by some other chain because you know, uh, by some other node, because you know, it's impossible to, um, uh, to cheat, thanks to Merkle proofs, thanks to Merkle trees that stores the information. So that's that's very amazing. That's very super. It was very surprising for me to learn about the data structure and how powerful they are. And but you know everything as everything in life, uh, you know there are two sides to every coin. Uh, so the Merkle trees are pretty um, intensive computationally because. As you update, you need to calculate multiple hashes. And I told you before that it takes, uh, I think, two, maybe for three weeks. Might be a little bit faster now because I know there was a lot of work on optimizing that. Uh, it takes, it's take a while to kind of um, to kind of download the history and walk through it. And the reason are, and that's pretty pretty funny because a lot of those other blockchains are saying we have faster consensus, we have faster this and faster that, but but really, the, the the biggest bottleneck in scalability of Ethereum today are Merkle Patricia trees. So it's like just write to those database, and every write is just an update in those tree. It, it basically takes weeks. It's not the bandwidth. It's not the speed of consensus algorithm that is the challenge. It is the uh, database. And now we have we have uh, we have some ideas how to make more efficient, how to build a struct. Uh, data structure with similar properties that are more efficient, um, but that's probably going to happen in the future. Uh, I want to tell you because we're already talking about the block and we're already talking about all the different things. So here's a, a in Solidity you can use a variable called block and it has a bunch of different fields and you can access all some of the fields that I was showing you before. So we can access Coinbase or it was called beneficiary difficulty gas limit for a whole block the number of the block. Uh, you can ask for the stamp, timestamp, and you can ask for the block hash, but you cannot ask for the uh, for all the block hashes. You can only ask for block hash of previous block or any of 256 most recent blocks. Uh, you cannot ask for hash of older blocks because Ethereum would not like to assume that the whole history uh, needs to be stored by the node, and you cannot ask about uh, the uh, hash of the current block. And it's your homework to figure out why. Uh, if you do, let us know in the comments. If you don't, we uh, we can answer that on a uh, networking event. Now, the Ghost Protocol. Uh, one more interesting thing about blockchain that is um, that we already kind of hinted here was that uh, of the Ethereum blockchain is that it has this notion of ankles. Why do we have ankles? Well. If you look at the Bitcoin, the block structure is pretty straightforward. Every every block has a parent, and if there is a um, a tie, and there are two miners that um, mine the block in similar time, uh, then then the winner is the one uh, who has uh, who will have uh, the, the then the information about who the winner is needs to wait for the next block to be mined. And the next block decides if they connect to the one block or the other. And if that happens, we know who the winner is. Uh, and as you know, the average time between the blocks on block uh, in Bitcoin is 10 minutes. So if you buy a house or if you buy a car, something of significant value, and you want to do a transaction on Bitcoin for that, which is what some people do, and I expect now that we have a bubble, it's going to be only more of those kind of transactions, then the recommendation is you wait six blocks. So on average, you wait one hour for six blocks to be mined because there might be a reorganization, a reorg. 
And the rework is basically when, you know, when Bitcoin node thinks this is the current state, but then the other block is being mined in top of the other block, and then it needs to switch to another branch. So uh, that is, you know, that kills usability. Like waiting one hour for transaction to go through is something we're not used to at any kind of transaction systems. So <clears throat> Ethereum is innovating on top of that. So they creating, uh, instead of using this idea of longest chain, like the chain that is has the most, uh, the most uh, is the longest, so have, you know, the parent to the parent to the parent, so on. Um, it used the idea of the heaviest chain. So it connects not only, not only the parents and children in the line, but also kind of connects, creates a tree of blockchain uh, of blocks via ankles. So let's say, let, let's, let, let's do an example. So let's say uh, there is a block A0 that was mined and let's say every, everybody in the world agree that is the, uh, that is the first block, right? And then there is a A1 block being mined that is uh, the send of the next block to A0, right? And in parallel, there is a B1 being uh, mined and they kind of in similar time, you can't really tell who's first in distributed network. So, um, so the question is, which, which is the right way to go, through A1 or through B1? So what A2 is doing is saying, I'm, 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 I'm mining on top of A1. I'm adding to Ethereum state you know, that was developed by A1. And, but B2 says, you know what? I see that there is, I'm building on top of B1, but I also see another block, which is C1, that someone else uh, mind perhaps a little bit later than B1. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm a child of B1, but I also have an uncle C1. And what Ethereum does is says, okay, this is the heaviest. This is, this is the biggest family. The big, this chunk represents the biggest uh, mining power, uh, the, the greatest mining power behind it, because there is, you know, uh, the same block, the same block number being um, mined twice. So um, in that sense, it strongly incentivizes it strongly incentivizes miners to include as many uncles as possible because if they don't, someone else will and will take over the reward. Now, the miner of the block that goes into main chain gets a reward, but uncle also gets a reward. So uncle gets, I think it's zero point seven of what uh, of the what B two and B one is getting. So that's still pretty a lot of money. So if I'm an uncle, I don't want to. I, I don't want to build another one. So let's say if I'm a one and I see there is another chain, and I'm already included as an uncle, it's fine. I'm not trying to build another block on top of my old block and just making sure that you know, just increasing my probability that the money is going to be there. It's fine. I already get my reward. I can mine in top of B two. So it. it in that way, there is a reduced incentive to do like a um, kind of pool mining when people try to compete against each other with different uh, with different kind of uh, uh, paths in the block tree. They just go for uh, you know connecting to the heaviest, connecting to the heaviest. Uh, uh, that's fine. I'm gonna be included in uh, as an uncle if I if I play nice. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so that was a bunch of algorithms and data structures. And I wonder if you have any questions. Uh, should we maybe go back to the studio? Make sure if you don't follow us yet, make sure you follow us uh, on Twitter. Ifworks is uh, where we work with Piot, and uh, if Marek is my personal account. And now, uh, hoping to back, uh, hoping to hear some questions, and I'm hoping to go back to the studio. <laughs> Mateusz, can you bring us back to the studio? Yeah, I think we, we're here. Okay. Yeah, a great question, a great question. Uh, so that's an advanced presentation. We're gonna, if you wanna know more about, be able to answer those kind of questions, uh, then come to one of our workshops or one of the future presentation, but I'm happy to answer this particular one. So there is a, 
uh, uh, unimerical error claim set claimed is here, right? And the question is, shouldn't it be after uh, sent tokens, right? Uh, so here's the thing how, uh, to give you more general explanation, um, here is how transactions work uh, on, uh, and smart contracts work on Ethereum blockchain. Every transaction is atomic. So either the whole transactions go through or it's reverts. So there are only two possible outcomes, success or revert. If transaction reverts, there is no change to the state of the blockchain whatsoever. It means like the transaction was never called. There is only an information that uh, there is only an receipt. There is an information that transaction failed, and how much gas it was used, and um, some amount of money is subtracted, some amount of meters are subtracted from from the balance of the issuer for the transaction. But other than that, there is no change to any variables. Uh, in the smart contracts or balances other than the sender, it, which means that uh, the order doesn't really matter. In most cases, there is also something we're going to talk in the future, which is re-entry attack, but we're not talking about it today. Um, so, so it really doesn't matter. So if we set it here, either the next other transaction will be successful and the whole, and the whole transaction will succeed or it will fail. And it doesn't matter if it failed in this line or in that line, the set claim will not be set at all. Yeah. I wonder if we have other questions. Yeah, can I can I add something there? Go for I it. Think, I think potentially if the token is any token, then you could have re-entrancy in this case. So it's best to first set the variable and then transfer. Yeah, let's not let's not talk about it yet. It's there's gonna be a presentation on security, and we're gonna go. I, I think it's gonna. I don't wanna. I don't wanna brag because I'm gonna be doing this presentation, but it might be one of the most interesting presentations so far because we're gonna show how people lose or some other people gain tens of millions of dollars, and in almost every single case, it was a single transaction that led into loss or gain. Uh, there was, you know, like. Forty million dollars one half, one hundred twenty million another half. There was three hundred thousand just yet uh, last year, so we thought like you know like and this pr presentation, you know, it's got only longer every year. So it's like there are new hacks every year, and I think there are so many that we only hear about you know some of them like if they really big or they really innovative, in a way they do that. 